All right, welcome to section 9.1. So we're skipping chapter eight and we'll get back to it later. And in chapter nine, actually, we're only covering two sections, 9.1 and 9.4. Um, the middle stuff, when we go to 9.4, I'll comment on why we don't really need it, um, or maybe at the end of this section. So 9.1 is um, what's called the order of an integer. And the primitive roots. And so here's the basic idea. So when we're working with modular arithmetic, um, the process of taking exponents becomes really important. Um, comes important for things like cryptography, um, things like that. So um, coupled with the concept of an exponent is the reverse concept of a logarithm. And all this is tied up in something called the order of an integer. So basically um, we'll say the process of um, exponentiation and therefore logarithms. They're technically known as, known as discrete logarithms here, but for right now we'll just say logarithms. Um, let's say are critical in modular arithmetic. for things like cryptography. When we do crypto cryptography, we'll see this. Um, so thus we need to sort of know how they work. So let's say, how does this work? Now it's easy enough to take a power, right? So that's not the issue. It's not a question of taking like a to the power of x mod m, right? That's not the big deal. The big deal is sort of what's happening under the hood. Um, when we can take logarithms, what that even means, like how if it makes sense, you know, whether it makes sense, etc. So I'm going to break this into two sections. First, the order of an integer. So here's sort of a like a preliminary note. Um, so let's suppose we're given we have a modulus. M uh, and an A, an integer A with GCD of A and M being one. And we'll see why this is necessary in a second, right? Um, so we know that, right, from Euler's theorem, we know that A to the phi of M is congruent to one mod m. So um, what this doesn't tell us, of course, it doesn't tell us is if phi of m is the smallest power that gives us one, right? So there could be a smaller power. Technically, what it's saying is that um, there is a smallest power by well ordering, right? Because <clears throat> there's a power phi of n that works, and maybe there's a smaller one. So this gives us our first definition. Um, so given a modulus m, let's just say given mod m and an a with gcd a and M being one, this is always going to be the case. Eventually, I'm going to stop repeating it over and over, but for right now. Um, so we'll define the order of A mod M to be the smallest positive integer. N such that a to the n is congruent to one mod m. So we'll denote this. So we denoted odd sub m of a. So 
One thing to note here is built into the definition here, this is the order of A mod M. Uh, the M is relevant, right? You can't just talk about the order of A. Sometimes we do when the N is, oh sorry, when the modulus is assumed, like if we're working mod 11, we might just say the order of two, but um, the 11 is, is necessary. So the M matters. Let's look at an example. So say, um, let's find the order of three mod 11. So um, we'll have some shortcuts soon, but for right now, we'll just make a notice. We'll observe, or we'll just uh, sort of do it by calculation. Let's observe three to the one is congruent to three mod 11, three to the two, congruent to 9 mod 11, 3 to the 3 is congruent to 5 mod 11, 3 to the 4 is congruent to 4 mod 11, 3 to the 5 turns out is congruent to 1 mod 11. So because this is the smallest power, in other words since um, 5 is the smallest power to give us one smallest positive power we have order mod 11 of 3 equals 5 so now little note here before we dive into some additional theorems what this basically says if you look at this example um, it basically says that every fifth power this will repeat, right? Because if you took three to the sixth, you'd get three again, right? So in this example, uh, say three to the x repeats when x repeats mod five. Um, uh, for example, e.g. three to the eight will be the same as three to the 13 correct that, 3 to the 13, because 8 is congruent to 13 mod 5. Right, this guy right here is mod 11. So because the exponent has repeated, oh, the mod 5, um, the power of 3 has repeated. So this can be sort of clearly spelled out in two theorems. Let's say this can be generalized with two theorems. So first theorem B, we'll say theorem one. So theorem one says the following, it says for positive integers X, we have A to the X is congruent to one mod M. The, um, for both of these theorems, I'm gonna assume that M is the modulus and that A is co-prime to M. Um, so a to the x is congruent to 1 mod m if and only if x is congruent to 0 mod the order of a mod m. Um, and this is, which is if and only if, this is not new, which is if and only if the order mod m of a divides x. Right. So just to see an example, if you look back at the one we just did, we see that we're we're going to get one, right? Whenever we have exponents that are multiples of five, right? Three to the five is one, three to the 10 will be one, etc. right? So the order mod 11 of three is five. So this means three to the X is congruent to one mod 11 when five divides X. So, you know, X could be five, 10, 15, etc. So the proof of this, the proof of both of the theorems we're going to give are fairly elementary. Um, so it's an if and only if. So let's do both directions. So here's the forward direction. So we're going to assume that a to the x is congruent to 1 mod m. We're going to claim that um, that the order 
mod m of a divides x. So what we'll do is we'll use a division algorithm to, um, to divide x by the order. So by the division algorithm, so x is some quotient times the order plus the remainder. This is where the remainder is between zero and less than, strictly less than the order. So then what we get, if we look at this one, this one is a to the x, but this is a to the q order plus r. This is all mod m. So this breaks up into a to the order to the q. That's going to be 1 times a to the r. This is 1 to the q a to the r mod m, which is a to the r mod m. Now, since r is less than the order, the only way that we could get a to the r being 1 would be if r is 0. So we must have r being 0, um, because anything to 0 is 1, that's convention in uh, modular arithmetic. And so since r is 0, x is q odd m a, so the order divides x, and that's that half done. Um, then the opposite direction is actually a little easier. Right? So let's suppose that the order sub m of a divides x. So what that means is, and here we claim that a to the x is congruent to 1 mod m. So the fact that the order divides x tells us that um, x is some alpha times the order of some positive integer. So then if you look at x to the a, or a to the x rather, this is a to the odd m a to the alpha, and this is 1 to the alpha, and this is 1. This is all mod m. And that's the end. So there's a nice corollary that comes out of this. And the corollary turns out to be useful. So the corollary is that, um, that the order divides phi of m. And the proof of this is pretty simple. The, order, the proof of this is that we know that um, a to the phi of m is congruent to 1 mod m. And then just apply the theorem, right? Because the theorem says that um, if a to the x is 1, then the order divides x. So since a to the phi is 1, the order divides phi. So just apply theorem. QED. So I'll tell you now why this is useful. So the reason this is useful is when we're trying to find the order, what this means is that the order has to divide phi. And since we know the order is... Um, definitely less than phi of m, this sort of gives us a very small set of things we need to try. All right, so this is useful when finding the order mod m of a, because we only need to check the divisors. So that's spelled badly. Um, we only need check the divisors of phi of m. So let's go back to our original example. So when we did uh, the order mod 11 of 3, that's a terrible looking 3. Um, right, so we did it before we found it was 5. Um, so actually, let's see, let's do a slightly different one. Let's do in the lecture notes that I put online. Let's say, so we can do something different. So when we do the order mod 11 of 2, right? So we know that phi of 11 is prime. This is 10. 
So this means we only need to, need to check divisors of 10, right? So this is what we see. So we check divisors of 10. So if you notice 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the 2 is 4, 2 to the 5, if we calculate this one, um, so two, so this is a bit of a headache, right? So two to the five is so is two to the two times two to the two times two to the one. So two to the two squared, which is two to the four, is sixteen. So sixteen is six times two is twelve. Sorry, I'm messing that up because I'm thinking more ten. So let me rethink that. So two to the well, this is easier. Two to the five is thirty-two, which mod eleven is negative one, which is the same as look, we can write negative one. This is the same as ten. Um, so now notice these are all mod eleven. Let's just make sure I'm doing mod the right thing. Um, at this point, we know it has to be ten, right? It has to be a divisor of ten. So now we know. Um, that the order mod 11 of 2 is 10. Right, and so I don't need to check 3, I don't need to check 4, and then once I get to 5, because the only other divisor is 10, like it has to be 10, and that's it. So, second theorem. We'll say theorem 2. So the first theorem just had to do with when the powers of A got us 1. So the second theorem is sort of even a little bit easier. It's just a statement about um, when two powers of A are similar. So here we have A to the X is congruent to, too many lines in that congruence. It's congruent to A to the Y mod M if and only if X is congruent to Y mod the order. So again, it's an if and only if, so we'll do both directions. They're both fairly brief. So the forward direction is, um, let's say, suppose that a to the x is congruent to a to the y mod m. And let's assume, without loss of generality, that x is greater than y. So since a is co prime to m, we can cancel a to the y from both sides. And we can cancel things that are co-prime without screwing off the modulus. So we can cancel a to the y from both sides. Uh, this tells us, so it meant then we have um, a to the x minus y is congruent to 1 mod m. Then apply the theorem. Let's say then by theorem 1, the order mod m of a divides x minus y. And that's done, because that's the same as saying that they're congruent mod the order. So then for the backward direction, now we're going to assume that x is congruent to y mod m. Oh, sorry, mod the order, mod m of a. So again, assume without loss of generality, x is greater than y. So what that means is that x is y plus some multiple of the order. All right, if they're congruent mod the order, it means they differ by a multiple of the order. If x is larger, it's y plus some multiple of the order. This is for some um, alpha in the integers, positive integers really, not that that really matters. So then if you look at a to the x, this is congruent, it's actually equal, but we'll say congruent is a to the y plus alpha order. This is mod, I have to make sure I keep writing my mods now um, because we have two mods floating around. We have mod the order and we have mod the original mod. So then this becomes a to the y, a to the order to the alpha. And then this second part is just 1, because that's the definition of the order. 
and that's a to the y mod m. And that's our QED. So nice and easy. So, so far we know what the order of an integer is. It's the smallest power that gives us one. And we know that that value tells us information about when we can get one, tells us information about when two powers will be the same. So next we need to look at primitive roots. So three primitive roots. mod m. So let's sort of backtrack, right? We know that, um, again, we have a modulus and a relatively prime thing. So we know given an m and gcd of a and m being one, that the order is definitely less than or equal to phi of m. That's where we began at the beginning. In fact, it divides it, but um, we'll say, in fact, divides. But sufficient for this discussion to say it's less than or equal to phi of m. So then we might say, like, well, what if it's equal to phi of m? Is this something special? So sometimes the order mod m of a equals phi of m. And this is really nice, as we'll see. But this gives us our first definition. So definition, you can probably see what's coming here, is a primitive root is exactly when the order is equal to phi of m. So given m and gcd of a and m being one, we say that a is a primitive root mod m, so let me underline that in blue. So this is precisely when the order mod m of a equals phi of m. Uh, so for example, we saw earlier that uh, the order mod 11 of 2 is 10, and that was phi of 11. So this tells us that 2 is a primitive root mod 11. So another example. Um, so let's see, one I gave in the book was um, 6 is a primitive root mod 11. So um, the nice thing about primitive roots will be sort of clarified by the following theorem. So let me give the theorem and give a proof, and then I'll sort of give an example that will really contextualize it, right? Um, so the nice thing about primitive root is the following theorem. theorem. So typically when we have a primitive root, I'm going to denote it, denote it with the letter R instead of the letter A. So I'll say if R is a primitive root, mod M, and the set given by R, R squared, R cubed, up to and including R to the phi of M, is a reduced residue set mod m. So recall what this means. Let me recall what it means, then I'll give you an example, then we'll do a proof. Um, and the example will help us see why this is relevant. So recall this means that there are phi of m of them. All are co prime to M and none of them 
are congruent to one another or to, to each other mod m. So let's say no two are congruent mod m. This is that's the definition of being a reduced residue set. So for example, so we saw that that two, let's call that R, is a primitive root mod 11. Right? So what that means is if you look at the powers of two, right, this is what they are, right? So we have two to the one, we have two to the two, and these are all mod 11. So we have two to the two, we have two to the three, which is eight, we have two to the four, which is 16, which is five. I'm gonna probably mess these up as I go because I'm doing them on the fly. Um, we have two to the six. Let me uh, work all these out. All right, so we have two to the six, um, that reduces to 10. We have two to the seven, that reduces to nine. Hold on, I think I have these out of whack. Let me just, um, I have the right numbers, but let's just step through them again because I think I'm calling the wrong powers. So I have two to the one is two, two to the two is four, two to the three is eight, two to the four is five, two to the five is 10, two to the six is nine, two to the seven is seven, interestingly, two to the eight is three, two to the nine is six, and two to the 10 is one, of course, because that's the order. 10 is the order, right? So if you look at these, this is basically um, the numbers one through 10, right? This is all of the things that are co-prime to 11. Right? This is a reduced residue set mod 11. Now it turns out that reduced residue sets, right? Those are sort of the important things, right? When we work with a certain modulus, and we'll see why in 9.4 a little more clearly, when we work with a certain modulus, uh, we typically only focus or often only focus on things that are co-prime to the modulus. So what's happening here is powers of two give us everything, right? They don't give us zero, but that's not co-prime, um, but every other thing they give us, right? So here's the proof of the theorem. It's pretty straightforward. So, so first, clearly there are phi of m of them, right? So remember we're proving um, this theorem right over here on the right. And we have to prove it by proving the three things listed here. So definitely there are phi of m because there are r to the one through r to the phi of m. Right? So clearly there exists phi of m of them. Um, now we need to make sure they're all co-prime to m. So this is pretty clearly, this is pretty clear, right? If one of them were not co-prime to m, so let's say uh, the GCD of R to the K and M were not one. Right? So take a prime that divides them both. Uh, let's say with P prime, P divides both. So since P divides R to the K, we know P divides R. Remember, if a prime divides a product, it divides one of the things. So it divides a bunch of R's, product of R's, it divides one of the R's, and they're all the same R, right? This is a contradiction because um, R is a primitive root, right? It, it, it originates as a thing that's co-prime to M. So this is not possible. So this is, we've got three things to prove. The first thing, the second thing, and the third thing we need to make sure that no two are congruent to one another mod m, right? So we'll say suppose that, for example, um, r to the i were congruent to r to the j mod m. So by the theorem, uh, this was theorem two, we then know that i is congruent to j mod the order but the order is phi of m. So, but then the i's and j's themselves are between one and phi of m, right? So like these differ by a multiple of phi, right? But since i and j are uh, 
uh, between, they're num strictly between, meaning they could be inclusive between one and phi of m, they must be the same. I must equal j. And that's the end. So um, all this proof, again, is just sort of clarifying what we see in the example over here to the right, is that when you get a primitive root, when you have a primitive root, the powers of the primitive root will give you all of the co-prime things. Right? Um, so this turns out to be pretty handy. So it also turns out to be the case that, like if you, if you believe this is useful, if you're like, hey, having a primitive root is kind of cool, um, you might say, like, do we always have primitive roots? And the answer is no. So just to clarify what we just said here, if, um, so given an M, right, having a primitive root is nice, right, because powers of it can give you everything that's coprime. It can give you, can give us all integers coprime to M. So this leaves you wondering, like, okay, so I've give, if I'm given an M, um, can I always find a primitive root? So the question is not, or well, the point is that not all M's, not all moduli have primitive roots. So I'll give you an example, a really simple example. M equals 8 has no primitive root. So this is easy to check, right? Because all we need to do is look at the things that are co-prime to eight and find their orders, right? So to see this, note um, the order mod eight of one is one. The order mod eight, we don't need to check two because two is not, um, not co-prime. So the order mod eight of three is two. This is because three to the two is congruent to one mod eight. The order mod eight of five is two because oops, five to the two is congruent to one mod eight. And the order mod eight of seven is two because seven to the two is one mod eight. So the point is that there are no A with GCD of A and M being one. Here M is eight. And the order mod eight of A being phi of eight, which is four. So no primitive roots. So when we're working mod eight, we don't have this nice behavior. So um, not such a nice modulus. Uh, however, when we do have primitive roots, it's actually pretty easy to, uh, to figure out how many primitive roots there are. So we'll sort of prove this in a couple of steps. So uh, more specifically, uh, however, if some M has a primitive root, then usually it has several. We'll clarify exactly what several means. Uh, we'll work this out uh, through a couple of theorems. So let's work this out uh, with some theorems. So um, theorem The first theorem is the theorem about the about the orders of powers of elements. So in other words, given a modulus M and an A that's coprime, we have, so this is a statement about the order mod M of A to the K. Right? So if I take a power of A, the order turns out to be the order mod m of a divided by the GCD of the order mod m of a and k. Now, little side note, this is totally obscure. 
that if you're in 403, um, this might ring a bell uh, in the language of cyclic groups. So there are a bunch of people in the class that are in 403 as well. So remember we had this statement. This is with the order of G being N. Right? So this is exactly the same statement, right? Like there's absolutely no difference between them because in the group theoretic context, we've got a G that has order N, it repeats every N. And now we're looking at the order of a power of G, same exact thing in this case, right? Nothing different. Um, if you're not on 403, there's no big deal. This is sort of an interesting fact because it sort of helps the 403, see, 403 people see how these two things are joined together. So here's a proof of this. The proof of this is a, it's sort of, um, it's not complicated. It's a little obscure in terms of, or it's a little calculationally headachey, but, uh, but we'll go through it and it's not too bad. And so we'll do it in two stages. So first note, we're going to make two notes. And these two notes will uh, join together to give us a result. So first note that. So if we take a to the k, and it may not be clear where this is going for now, so just let's make sure the calculation makes sense. And we raise this to um, the thing that we're trying to show it is. Let me, um, let me circle some things. So I'm going to raise this a to the k to this power, which is absolutely really, looks really atrocious because it kind of is. So I'm going to raise it to the power of the order m a divided by the GCD of order m a and k. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite things a bit, right? So I'm going to switch the positions of the k and the order sub m of a. So I'm going to write, rewrite this. So all I'm doing is switching exponent powers around this. No modular arithmetic is happening right now. I'm just going to write it like this. And then k divided by the GCD of order m a and k. Now let me clear some space here. All right, so this is all... Um, these are actually just equal. I said congruent, but they're equal. And then what happens if we look at this bit right here, the order mod m of a is the power that I raise a to in order to get one. So this is going to give me one by definition of order mod m of a. So what this gives us, this says it's congruent to one to this power Notice that this power, even though the power is a fraction, it's still an integer because the GCD of the order of mod m of a and k is a divisor of k. So k divided by that is still an integer. This is mod m and that's congruent to one mod m. So this is the first thing. So the, what this shows us is when I raise a to the k back at the beginning to this power, I get one. So this tells us that the order mod m of a to the k is less than or equal to this. So stop to consider why that's true, right? If I take an element and I raise it to a power and I get one, that says the, the order is no more than that exponent, right? So over here on the left, let me label some things in, let's say, uh, red. So when I raise this thing to this power, I get one over here. So that means that the order is definitely less than or equal to this. So that's the first thing we get here. So you might be able to see where this is going. What we're going to do is we're going to show that the reverse is true. In other words, that the order is greater than or equal to this. Right? So second, this is a little more awkward here, unfortunately. Uh, so second, note by the definition of the order of a to the k. All right, so let me clarify that when we go. If I take a to the k to the order 
sub m of a to the k. This is a to the k to the order mod m of a to the k. So by the definition of the order of a to the k, this is 1. This is by definition of the order of m of a to the k. In other words, it's by the definition that says when I raise a to the k to its order, I will get 1. Right? Um, so this tells us, however, because if we look back, let me label something in red again. Um, when I raise a to this power right here, I get 1. So that says the order of a must be less than or equal to k order m of a to the k. By the same reason that the red was in the other thing, right? If you take a and you raise it to a number and you get 1, then the order of a is less than or equal to that number, right? Um, in fact, we know more than that. That the order of m of a divides k right? because we know that if you raise it to power and you get 1, that the order of the element, in this case a, divides the power that you're raising it to. That was by the first theorem, right? Now, it follows from here. So what I can do is I can divide both of these. In fact, let me, in the lecture notes I didn't write so much. Let me write a little bit more here, right? For this division to be true, right, means there exists an alpha such that alpha order m of a is k order m of a to the k. And what I'm going to do is, uh, yeah, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to divide both sides by the GCD of the order mod m of a and k. So what we get is this. the comma that shouldn't be there. Hold on, let me clarify that. Order M A K order M A to the K. And so um, both of these two fraction like things are integers because the GCD is a divisor of both of them. So when I divide the order mod M of A by it, I get an integer. When I divide K by it, I get an integer. So from there, we now have The fact so if you ignore the alpha now what we get is this really atrocious looking statement in other words i'm going to rewrite it as a division so then the next thing to observe is that these two things, let me label these, let me point these out in blue, these are co-prime. So one of the first two things we learned about the GCD is when you take two things and you divide them both by the GCD of them. Right? So if you have an A and a B and you divide each of them by the GCD of A, B, A and B, the two results are relatively prime because you've divided away all the common things. So see, since these are co-prime, we have another theorem that says if you divide a product and you're co-prime to one of them, then you divide the other one. So thus, the order M A over the GCD divides the other one because it's co-prime to the first one. Right? So since it divides the other one, it's less than it. We don't really need to write this, but that's okay. Less than or equal to it. So now, if we stop and we look, let's label this in purple, because purple's cool. Um, if we take this guy from the second calculation, 
and this guy back here on the right from the first calculation, those are complementary, right? The one, on, the first one says that the order mod m of a to the k is less than or equal to the fraction, and the one that we just did says the fraction is less than or equal to the order. So together, we have equality. This is exactly what the theorem said, in case you lost track. That's a QED. That's messy. If you um, if you sort of, that's a bit tricky to follow. It's a great proof to follow because it uses a lot of what we've learned. But if it's a little sort of bit of a headache, it's no big deal. Um, so let's look at a simple example. So a simple example. Um, so if we look at the order mod 10 of say um, 3. In this case we get 4. So this is because, just to reference, this is because 3 to the 1 is 3, 3 to the 2 is 9, 3 to the 4 is 1. And remember, we only need to look at powers which are divisors of phi of 10, which is 4. Uh, so 3 to the 3 we never need to look at. These are all mod 10. So then suppose we wanted the order of, say, I don't know, 3 to the 6. We don't need to do any work for that. We just say, look, this is the order mod 10 of 3 over the GCD of the order mod 10 of 3 and this power 6. So this is 4 over the GCD of 4 and 6, which is 4 over 2, which is 2. And that's the end. All right, so here are the final two corollaries. This lecture is getting pretty long, but we're almost done. So the final two corollaries will tell us about all the other primitive roots. So suppose R is a primitive root mod M, then R to the K is a primitive root mod M. If and only if the GCD of K and phi of M is 1. So the proof of this is easy. Um, so, well, we know, what does it mean? Uh, for, R to K, for, for R to the K to be a primitive root, right? So R to the K is a primitive root. If and only if the order mod M of r to the k is phi of m. But that's equal to the order mod m of r, because r itself is a primitive root. Right? This is if and only if the GCD of the order mod m of r and k is 1. Right? So this is if you go back just to reference, if you go back to this statement right here, right, the numerate the, the left hand side will be equal to the numerator if and only if the denominator is one. Right? So this is the denominator right here that we just wrote down. The denominator is the GCD of the order mod m of r comma k. So if that's one, right? And that will be one. This is if and only if the GCD of phi and m and k is 1. That's just because the order of r itself is phi of m, right? And that's the end, right? QED. So for example, uh, we saw that 6 is a primitive root mod 11. So um, since P of 11 is 10. We know, for example, two things. We know 6 to the 3 is a primitive root because the GCD of 
let's say 3 and 10, doesn't matter which way we write it, is 1. And we know that 6 to the 4 is not, because the GCD of 4 and 10 is not 1. So this tells us a way of finding the other primitive roots, right? You take the powers that are co-prime to phi of m, right? So this gives us our final sort of fun theorem. So final corollary, which is fun and fast, which is a, if there is a primitive root mod m, and there are phi of phi of m of them. So that's kind of funny. So the proof is easy, right? So the proof is, um, suppose R is a primitive root, mod M, because we're saying if there are any, so let's let um, R be one of them. So by the previous corollary, corollary um, R to the K. Now keep in mind that, that R to the K um, like all the other things that are co-prime look like R to the K. Right, so let me, I'll say that at the end because I'm not sort of saying it particularly well right now. By the previous corollary, R to the K is also a primitive root mod M if and only if the GCD of K and phi of M equals one. So then we say, like, well, how many such k are there? So how many k have this? Well, how many things are co-prime to phi of m? Well, phi of phi of m of them. And that's really the end, right? So a little note here that I wanted to make reference to the point that I made this is by the previous corollary, is um, all things co-prime to M have the form R to the K because um, that set that we looked at earlier form a, a reduced residue set. Right. This is why we only need to look at R to the Ks. So for example, um, mod 10. There are primitive roots, right? Because we found one. Thus, there are phi of phi of 10, which is, sorry, uh, mod 11, my bad, backtrack, mod 11, there are primitive roots because we found one, so there are phi of phi of 11, which is phi of 10, which is four of them, and that's the end. Long section, but we're finished.